On our panel today, we have, uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Paul DePace. I'm a Director of Capital Projects for the University, and I'll be honored to be on this uh, honor colloquium panel. Uh, I've been a, uh, uh, started out as a, uh, an athlete, first competing in 1968, retired now, um, and, uh, but very much enjoyed the benefits of uh, athletic competition for persons with disabilities. Um, I never really was at the highest level to become a, uh, an athlete on the Paralympic team for the U.S., uh, but uh, I was fortunate enough to serve in a number of roles uh, throughout the years. Uh, probably the highlight of my career was being the chef de mission for the U.S. team in uh, 1992 at uh, Barcelona, Spain. Um, but on our panel, we have people that have both achieved at a high level uh, in, the, in the athletic careers, but also going on to do other things that have advanced the program for athletes with disabilities. So let me introduce the panel to you. First, uh, Sir Philip Craven. Sir Philip's contributions to wheelchair and Paralympic sports far exceed his own competition in the 1970s and 80s in wheelchair basketball and swimming. Uh, a select few of these uh, contributions include being a member of the board of the London 2012 Organizing Committee for the Olympics and Paralympics, a member of the executive board of the British Olympic Association from, 2000, from 2013 to 2017, a member of the International Paralympic, International, excuse me, president of the International Paralympic Committee from 2001 to 2017, a member of the International Olympic Committee from 2003 to 2017. He is currently an independent member of the supervisory board of the Tennis Integrity Unit. He received numerous awards and honorary doctorates in Great Britain, other European and Asian countries, and was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II for services to Paralympic sport. And clearly the driving force uh, for moving the Paralympic uh, uh, program forward at the international level for the last 16 plus years. I'd like to introduce Angelie J. Former Pratt. Angelie is a PhD assistant professor in the Department of Human and Organizational Development with secondary appointments in the Department of Special Education and Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. She's also a member of the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center for Research on Human Development. Her primary area of research relates to disability identity development. She presents regularly at state, national, and international conferences and is the author of 28 peer-reviewed journal documents and a number of other chapters. As a wheelchair user herself for over 30 years and a two-time Paralympian and medalist, Dr. Former Pratt is also nationally and internationally recognized as a disability leader and mentor. Welcome, Angelique. And on the panel today, let me uh, recognize Brett Parks. Brett is a pioneering founder in wheelchair tennis. After being injured in a skiing accident at the age of 18, Brad began experimenting with tennis as a measure of therapy, and in 1976, wheelchair tennis was born, with the first wheelchair tennis tournaments being held only one year later. His efforts to grow the sport in being, excuse me, his efforts to grow the sport resulted in the sport being spread internationally, currently played in over 100 countries. Wheelchair tennis is now fully integrated with the International Tennis Federation and is played at all four Grand Slam tennis tournaments. All of this was accomplished with only one change in the rules of tennis. Brad retired from competitive play in 1995 after winning numerous medals, including gold medal in tennis doubles in the 1992 Paralympics in Barcelona and more than one dozen national tennis single titles. Brad was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame in 2010 and in the country, 
contributor category. Welcome panel. So people want to know, people that will be listening to this honest colloquium want to know about sport, how it was from your personal end and what you've done to help develop it because you all have had major roles in that. So who would like to start off? Let's start off with ladies first. Angelique, tell sure. us about your uh, experience, both competitive and after. Sure. So I think, you know, for me, I grew up in Natick, Massachusetts, so just outside of Boston. And for me, it was actually growing up watching racers in the Boston Marathon competing that really got me excited about the possibilities of disability sport and getting involved. At the time, there was not as, as much availability of participation in disability sport as there is even, even now today. And so it took a commitment on my family's part in order to bring me out to a Saturday sports clinic for kids with, with disabilities to get involved. And, and that was when I, I fell in love with the sports with speed. So downhill skiing and wheelchair racing were my bread and butter. And I was really fortunate to get involved with, with sports and to have that become a, a large part of my identity and, and who I was really growing up. Um, so much so that I ended up choosing a college based on the availability of, uh, of, of sports there. And so I attended the University of Illinois in, in Urbana-Champaign where wheelchair racing was, was a, a recognized varsity level um, collegiate sport for athletes with disabilities. Um, it was during my time there that I made my first Team USA and actually got to be teammates and competitors alongside with Dr. Blowett. So, um, for, so Beijing was my first game, as, um, and, then, and then I also um, continued on competing in, in 2012 in, in London as well. And, you know, I think for me, the, the, the trajectory in terms of getting involved in sport and, and so forth has been, has been something really, really remarkable that has stayed with me throughout my, my career now as a researcher and as a professor. So extending that further, I've also been involved working with, um, with several other countries to develop uh, Paralympic programs and opportunities for individuals with disabilities to get involved in sport, particularly in Bermuda, um, Ghana, and Zambia, and a little bit in India too. Um, and, you know, from my research, I've also looked at how is it that disability sport can really open doors for people with disabilities in terms of access to employment, access to education, access to all of the all of these different basic human rights and sport is, is something that that's able to kind of draw draw people in and, and people get really excited about it and of course the the other cool level was was to also be able to mentor some of those athletes to also reach it to the pinnacle being the Paralympic Games so that's a that's a little snapshot in terms of some of that trajectory and and I'm so grateful to have been exposed to sport and to have that be still such a huge part of who I am today even though I'm not actively competing but having it inform uh, the research and the work that I do today. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sir Philip. Okay, well, Paul, thanks for that. And great to hear what uh, Anjali uh, uh, told us about herself. Well, at school, when I was on my feet, uh, I loved uh, playing sports, so tennis, cricket, cricket, of course, you Americans won't know much about, and, uh, um, and also football, uh, also swimming. Um, football was my favorite, possibly, uh, but I was never any good at it. I didn't have that sort of football uh, coordination. I had amazing hand, well, I would say ha hand-eye coordination uh, for catching and throwing. But I didn't like the training at all. So uh, I just liked, liked competing. So I didn't make it too far. Then I had this rock climbing accident in, when I was 16, so in 1966. And um, then I saw on the third day that I was lying in bed after the accident, wheelchair basketball being played outdoors in front of the window where I, where I was. And that's something uh, got into me there. And a year later, I was playing in the... Uh, local club team and um but I, I just loved the sport I, I loved it so much you know I said I didn't like the training I loved the training as much as the playing if not even more you know learning there are so many facets to learn about the game and then I got involved really in the administration because there were so many things wrong with the game you know doctors still controlled it and doctors really used it quite rightly, as a rehabilitation process. But I don't think that they realized just how great the athletes could be 
we weren't patients messing around with sport. We were playing sport. And so uh, I got involved. I had a lot of arguments with the founder of our mo the Paralympic movement, uh, Sir Ludwig Gutmann. I won't go into those now, but they got a bit, little bit heated. I was 26 and he was 76 at the time. And, um, um, and then I, I moved on with that. But I think the key thing that I had was that the common denominator was sport. It wasn't disability. And then, of course, I developed that thought of, um, of sport for all. I mean, in the UK, sport for all means sport below the high uh, competitive level. Whereas for me, it means sport for everybody. And then you have to make sure that that possibility is there for everybody. But don't, I think a lot of people are put off by the word disability, this other world. This other world that's not really connected to maybe the able-bodied world. And I think that if we have a common denominator of sport, great positive word normally, uh, we can move forward a lot more easily. But, um, but therefore, how do we progress and how did the Paralympic movement progress? Well, I'm not going to go into too much detail there, except to say that I was interviewed on National Public Radio uh, during the 2004 Paralympic Games in Athens and this guy says to me it was about one in the morning so it was live I think in the US and he said isn't this a disaster that uh, you know that uh, Paraly the Paralympics aren't shown on TV you know in the US isn't it a disaster for the IPC the International Paralympic Committee I said well I said it's not a disaster for us I said it's a disaster for the American athletes their families and the American people that they can't see these great athletes in action but I said we can wait for you, you know, you'll, you'll awaken one day. And, uh, and in fact, that has happened. And uh, supposedly said something else that was then repeated in Congress for, from the games in London uh, in, in 2012. But it takes time and it takes longer in different countries for so many different reasons. And you have to have the right people in charge of the TV companies, maybe, maybe government who, who are open to, to, to these new and revolutionary ideas and uh, and this in fact is what had happened in london in 2012 channel four and not the good old bbc got the uk rights for the games and channel four with this relatively small young vibrant organization that absolutely made the most of those rights and i think uh, you know yeah, both of you were there angeli and, and brad i'm not sure if you were there paul in 2012 but it was channel four that was one of the great revolutionary forces there. And, and that now has spread to so far all over the world. And a man called Dan Brooke, he was, he was absolutely fundamental. He was one of the directors and he got it. And he thought this was gonna be brilliant. What has that led to at Channel 4? It's led to the employment of many former para-athletes, you know, either as commentators, but also in other roles. And, uh, and Channel 4 now has got the highest rating. I think it's the only company in the UK that gets EY's highest uh, rating for diversity in employment. So uh, you, let's use sport as the common denominator. That's what I would say. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Sir Philip. Brad, you were the... Uh the firebrand that uh, started and developed wheelchair tennis to the highest level now where it's in the Grand Slam tournaments. So tell us about that. Tell us about the growth, your first involvement and uh, how you helped grow the sport. Well, um, when I was in the hospital, uh, realizing I'm never gonna walk again, uh, I started to just imagine different sports and different things that I'm gonna be able to do with my life. and. And I always had it in the background that, you know, maybe I'd walk, maybe I'd get better. But uh, I always, I kind of just said to myself, okay, if I don't get better and if I pursue these things, these activities to make myself as good as I could be, um, I'm going to be better off. And if I do get better, I can look back and I can say, okay, what a great experience um, that was, you know, that I was able to experience life in a wheelchair and do some of these different things. And, and uh, so as soon as I got out of the hospital, my, we were at this family picnic and my parents knew that uh, we were in Indiana visiting family, lived in California. And I knew that 
you know, my parents knew I wanted to play tennis. They're playing tennis on the court. My dad turned around and goes, Brad, why don't you, let's do this. Let's try this thing. And I went out there and he fed me some balls and I started hitting balls. And I said to myself, I'm going to give myself a year to see if it's possible that someone can play tennis in a wheelchair. Then um, a month later or a month after I was released, I went back for a checkup and I was introduced by one of the, um, you know, one of my friends on the ward that, you know, that, you know, was in the hospital with me. He was a quadriplegic uh, buddy and, and uh, um, he introduced me to Jeff Minnebreaker who, you know, my um, rec therapist was Ed Owen, which I'm sure everybody knows. Um, then Jeff Minnebreaker um, um, is the new rec therapist since I had left. He introduced me to Jeff. He goes, Jeff is playing wheelchair tennis. And I said, I got to meet this guy. So Jeff and I became instant friends. And he had already thought of this two bounce rule that is, you know, the only rules. He had a couple other things that he used to tweak at that time, um, but uh, different rules and things, but that stuck with it. So Jeff and I become friends. He takes me, you know, with that later that summer, he takes me and another, um, you know, fellow friend, disabled friend to the San Diego wheelchair games. And it was there that I saw um, Dave Kiley and Steve Scott race. It was very small, local type games. It wasn't a state games or anything like that. And, but I saw Dave and Steve race in the 1500 meters. And I was absolutely in awe. The, the back and forth, the drafting, and this was probably not even on a track. It was probably in a big parking lot. But I saw these two guys and they were, in my opinion, superstars. They were celebrities. I was just completely in awe. And I said, I want to be a part of that. So tennis was always a big part of my life and I continued to play, but I also took up racing and I loved racing and I loved the wheelchair games in those days and, and you know, throughout the country. Eventually I made the team, um, the Paralympic team uh, and I went to Stoke Mandeville in 79 and then the Paralympic games in Holland and Arnhem and uh, had some success, but I even brought my tennis rackets with me and I even, did some kind of, you know, casual clinics with just, you know, was never organized or anything else, but I would meet somebody, I would tell them about tennis and we'd go on the courts there at Stoke Mandeville and, and we'd hit, you know, I'd feed them balls and stuff. And um, anyway, after those games, um, I got together with some people and we, and we formed this national organization, National Foundation of Wheelchair Tennis to develop wheelchair tennis. Fortunately, I had to give up the racing because I knew I couldn't do both. And we were, we were off. And over the years, there was a lot of struggles. It was difficult. I remember having conversations with Stan Lobanovich, uh, the head of the commissioner of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. And he had specifically targeted wheelchair tennis as a non-feasible sport. So it was pretty discouraging. And, uh, um, you know, I go... I questioned really what I was doing. Um, was I wasting my time? Stan thought I was at the time. Of course, years later, I remember looking out at a tennis court. It was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I see a hundred wheelchair tennis players playing on these 12 courts in this nice tennis club. And I said to myself, all right, this is wheelchair tennis. We are, we are something. We're going to be something. And I remember later, Stan and I had a conversation and, and of course he goes, Hey, I was wrong. And, uh, um, he wanted to know how, cause we were at the time we were developing a great relationship with the USTA and the international tennis federation. And he wanted to know how we were doing that. And so, you know, of course things changed, but, uh, it was, um, I mean, I think it was the best thing that ever happened to wheelchair tennis and, and it was, uh, how it's grown over the years to be a part of the, of the game. And, I think the one, another, you know, that event that happened in Grand Rapids was a, um, a big deal for me to, to where I just was sitting out there looking at these 12 tennis courts and all these wheelchair tennis players and they were wearing tennis clothes and they had two rackets and we had umpires and we're playing at this beautiful club. And that to me was a big moment. But when the two bounce rule was 
um, officially became part of the of the rules book um, that the International Tennis Federation published. That was, I think, probably you know in the early '90s. I don't remember exactly. It was a um, the, it was at their annual general meeting in Greece, and I'm sure it was you know was in the early '90s or late '80s when that happened. And I and at that point was a was a breakthrough as well that hey we're part of the game and and we're going to be something. And then shortly thereafter we're part of the Paralympics, which was a huge thing. And of course now with in the Grand Slams the players are and and you know, the, you know, when I first saw Dave Kiley and Steve Scott compete, I saw them as these amazing athletes. And I think when people see the wheelchair tennis players competing at the Grand Slams, they look at them as being amazing athletes. And uh, so I think that uh, we've come so far from the early 70s when I thought I was going to get kicked off most of the tennis courts that I would play on because wheelchairs don't belong on a tennis court where we are today. It's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. I'm very pleased with where we at, where we're at, but Hey, we still, we can still go forward. Right. Good. Great to see the part of the grand slam tournaments. But what I was really amazed about what you said was you got Stan Lebanowicz to admit he was wrong about something. <laughs> I didn't get him. He, he volunteered that 100%. And so I don't know whatever you did to do that, but, uh, so let's go back a little bit in the history. Uh, Phil, you were uh, uh, being uh, a Brit um, and uh, spent many years at uh, Stoke Manville. Uh, maybe you could tell us about the history. For the, for the rest of the folks here, Stoke Manville was really the start of the Paralympic movement. Uh, yeah. Where, uh, tell us the Paralympic about movement, that. But... Sorry. Go uh, ahead. Yes, it was. I mean, I, I didn't get there until 67 uh, for the first national games. And, uh, but of course, uh, I think the first international encounter was in uh, 52 when there was an archery competition between uh, uh, injured uh, soldiers from the Second World War from the Netherlands and from Great Britain. And then that grew. But when the Pan Am Jets... Uh, the American, already sponsored, you see, by Pan Am, Pan American Airlines in 55, when they got to Stoke Mandeville, I'm, I may use an American accent, which will be terrible here in a moment, but they said, geez, where are the backboards? Because <laughs> the Brits played wheelchair netball, which for most men was a woman's game, and you didn't have a backboard, you just had a hoop, you know? And so wheelchair basketball had been founded in... Uh, in uh, in the states in 45 on the west coast and the east coast and i remember my very best friend uh, tip tibuto again from boston uh who was interviewed on uh, brazilian tv back in i don't know when uh, the 80s sometime we were down there in rio and uh and the french coach robert perry uh for the men's wheelchair basketball team he was he was asked the question well where did wheelchair basketball start and uh, and uh, he said, oh, it's Stoke Mandeville. And Tip nearly had an apoplectic fit, you know, and said, no, it was the US, quite rightly, and, uh, and corrected him live on Brazilian TV. And, and so something started at Stoke Mandeville. I think a little bit, if you think about the history of basketball, uh, it really didn't become a worldwide sport until the YMCA took it around the world. And I think that's what uh, Stoke Mandeville did so many people from all over the world came to Stoke Mandeville and learned about these sports, some of which were founded in the, in the UK, but others were invented in the States, for example, or, or elsewhere. And, uh, but it was medical doctors that ran the show there. And, uh, and so Ludwig Gutmann had had to come over. He, he escaped the Nazis and arrived, uh, I think, in the UK in 38, you know. And, um, but he was invited before D-Day when they knew there would be so many uh, injured, spinally injured uh, soldiers coming back to the UK, whether they were American, whether they were British, uh, Canadian, whatever they were, uh, that he had then to fight the medical establishment in the UK who had no time 
for these injured soldiers because they couldn't go back out and fight. And before Gutman came along, they were allowed to die within a few months of infection, you know, and pumped up with, uh, with morphine just to, to help them pass away. And he changed all that. But to do that, he had to be a dictator. But he was a dictator also when he founded the sports movement. And that's what I came up against. And I wasn't going to have any of it. You know, especially when in the UK team, the Great Britain team, we had a rubbish bas wheelchair basketball coach and an absolute garbage swimming coach. And, uh, and so I got into uh, a bit of a dust up with him, with him and uh, I got banned for life in 1977, along with my <laughs> best mate. You know, I couldn't play wheelchair basketball again for the UK and the, uh, for Great Britain. And Great Britain went from being European champions and world champions in the early 70s to I think at the Europeans in 77, we were ninth. So they invited me back. Jerry never played for Great Britain again. He was one of the greatest players in the world. Um, but I did and decided that we had to change things uh, from the inside out. And, and that's what we did. And, uh, and now it's sport. And, um, but Storm Annabelle was really the launch pad to the world of para sport. And we have to really thank them for that. And, uh, and without Sir Ludwig Gutman, I wouldn't be here now. You wouldn't be here now. Angel Angeli wouldn't be here now and Brad Parks wouldn't be here now. So from a rehabilitation point of view, the guy was amazing. But I'll tell you what, he was he was the boss. And if you took him on, you had to fear for your life. But uh, <laughs> life didn't count much for much at 26, did it? You know, you could you could go into battle. That must have been, uh, uh, sorry I missed that fight, but between you and Sir, uh, Sir Goodman, uh, well, that'll come out in the memoirs if I ever write them. And uh, um, but it, but it was, and he didn't like it. I know that from uh, some um, people who told me the state he was in when he got home the night after we'd had our bus stop. And uh, and so, uh, but anyway, I, there I'm wouldn't be any videotape of that fight, would there? Well, it, well, it, it wasn't just him. Uh, I took on in the, in his office that morning when I was called to account. There was the wheelchair basketball coach, the swimming coach, the team manager, who I'd lambasted the night before, uh, John Scruton, his, his in, indomitable secretary, and himself. And, and I'd, I'd just said to the basketball coach and the swimming coach what I thought about them. And before I got at the team manager, Gutman intervened and said, this is your last chance. And if you, if you don't, change your ideas you won't be going to uh, Toronto for the Paralympics in 76 even though I'd already been picked for the team you know so the first time ever in my life and 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 since I backed away and I thought well I'll live to fight another day and that's what I did well can I just I just wanted to add something there I you know we had a, a bit of the same thing in the U.S. in the uh yep. in the late 70s right Paul with yes ben? I mean Ben Lipton, an amazing man, like, like Sir, who really led our, our organization for so many years, but uh, um, there was some difficulty in stepping aside at some point in time. And I tell you what, it affected me when I knew it was time to step down with wheelchair tennis and bring up new and fresh blood into the organization. Yep. It's the thought of doing, you know, maybe what um, Sir... Uh, Ludwig Gutmann, you know, went through. I didn't realize his was like that, but I know with us, um, Ben and Cy Bloom and some of the early um, folks in, you know, they had a hard time stepping aside in some of that organization. And I never wanted to to do that. And um, it was, I think it was the best thing that happened with us with wheelchair tennis, but it was a, a learning experience for me. To see no, that. I was in the, in the U.S. for uh, books here, the U.S., the the, the games uh, really started uh, at the Bulova School of Watchmaking in New York, in Queens, yeah. New York, uh, because it was seen coming out of the Second World War. That was a big growth period for, uh, as Phil was saying, as uh, athletes or individuals coming back from the Second World War uh, alive, but with some type of disability. So the Bulova School of Watchmaking um, had a program for persons with disabilities because it was seen that watchmaking, when you made watches, uh, was an appropriate uh, career uh, employment for a person with a disability. 
And so the game started there in, in Queens. And I remember the first games that I went to there in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, the sprints were short. They were more like 60, uh, 60 yards. And it was in a parking lot at the bowl of a school. And you wanted to make sure that you didn't get lane number four because that's the one that had the manhole cover in it. And you knew you were going to become airborne somewhere during the course of the race. So not a good idea. We eventually moved it on and, uh, and the, the games were moved around the U.S. But Angeli, um, you're uh, uh, from University of Illinois. That was actually the home, at least the way I remember it, of wheelchair basketball where Stan Lebanowicz was and was uh, one of the movers in, in that program. Uh, still a very strong sport, but, um, um, and, uh, but University of Illinois is one of the hotbeds of where places with, uh, for athletes with disabilities go to both get their education and their training. Tell us a little bit about the university. Yeah, so the University of Illinois was was um, one of the first public universities to open its doors to students with disabilities. So kind of paralleling exactly what you all have been showcasing in terms of the history. You know, folks were coming back injured from from the war and were wanting to take advantage of the GI Bill and um, and and this and they were um, through through a series of series of loopholes to be honest with you um, where it was able to was able to navigate the red tape there and to be able to open its doors and to really start to build a rehabilitation program including including uh, growing the sport of, of wheelchair basketball and for me as a as a kid growing up so a little bit different from from Brad from, from, from your story I've, I've had my disability since I was a baby and so I, I was four and a half months old when I got sick with transverse myelitis and so for me, this using a wheelchair is all that I had ever known, but it made it really hard to envision a life for myself of going to college, having a job, getting involved in sport without seeing those, those role models and seeing, seeing what was possible. And that's really what, um, what seeing older athletes, as I said before, competing in the Boston Marathon did for me, seeing them wearing their, their Illinois jerseys and so forth um, helped me to realize like what was possible. For me, growing up in Massachusetts, my high school was uh, completely inaccessible for students with disabilities. And so um, that was a huge component in my own college search process, um, which, which just automatically made Illinois rise to the top of the list. Something that I didn't realize too at the time was that I was, uh, I was subconsciously comparing every university and college that I was doing tours of to the University of Illinois because as a teenager, I had actually spent time on Illinois' campus as, a, as an athlete going to their wheelchair sports camps. And so what I, and, and so, you know, just that subtle messaging of being there on campus, staying in the dorm, seeing the accessibility firsthand as a teenager, long before I was even looking at colleges for, you know, wanting to potentially attend, I was actually making those comparisons without even realizing it, um, you know, as I was going through that college search process as, as, a, um, as I was in high school. And so for me, that, that, that environment was really, really a, just a fantastic, um, fantastic uh, uh, place to be. The other piece too, that not many people know, is that they also have um, supports for individuals with higher support needs. And so individuals that, that need personal care attendance and so forth. And so there's actually been a history of, of um, bocce players and wheelchair football and, and other sports, uh, wheelchair, power soccer as well for individuals with higher support needs too, not just on the wheelchair basketball side and the wheelchair track side. And so I think that that's another really important piece of that history. Glad that you, uh, you mentioned the university. As I said earlier, I'm director of capital projects at the University of Rhode Island, but my uh, accident happened uh, actually while I was a student at the university in my, I don't know whether this is my second junior year or my first senior year. I took a little bit of time to get through college. So, and so I had to come back and, and finish uh, uh, after my accident. Um, but uh, after going out into industry for a while, I came back to the university. And one of the things that I'm most happy with is over the course of the years, it's been part of my responsibility to renovate spaces in the university so that it became more accessible both the residence halls and the uh, uh, and all of the uh, buildings at the university. So 
that was good. Angela, glad to hear you mention the, the Boston Marathon because I think that was one of the first road races uh, that, uh, that brought that sport uh, uh, in one of the more popular sports, certainly one of the more high profile sports uh, to be matched up with that. And I remember the, the, the first athlete that I'm aware of that, that worked, uh, ran the Boston Marathon was Bob Hall uh, out of Belmont, Mass. Uh, he did that in 1975. He inspired us, and we put a committee together, negotiated with the Boston Marathon Committee. And in 77, uh, we had the first wheelchair athletes officially appearing in the Boston Marathon, seven athletes. Um, and it was, uh, now it's more popular. It's, it's of course, the, uh, it's expected that uh, this is going to happen. Uh, every year and in every marathon now that you read about it out in the world, uh, there is the, uh, there is this happening. Um, Brad, uh, I think one of the highest profile things, and I think all of which, what everyone is saying here, uh, is the fact that uh, athletes have become, uh, it becomes more normal and uh, have become a very high profile. And I think by being high profile athletes, showing persons with disabilities doing physical things uh, and an incentive to those that might not want to compete or could compete at, uh, at the national or international level, but gives them the incentive and show them what is possible. So uh, Brad, uh, in, in your work with wheelchair tennis, I think one of the great accomplishments that you and your team had was to get into the national tournaments, the Grand Slam tournaments. How did, uh, how did that negotiation go? What can you tell us about that? Well, um, um, most of, I mean, this all happened really after, um, you know, my involvement. Um, it all really started with uh, um, personal relationships. Uh, from when we first started the National Foundation for Wheelchair Tennis, the only organization at the time, one of our plans and goals from the very beginning was to develop a relationship with the USTA. And so I would go to the annual meetings. I was introduced um, to um, one of the um, upper executives of the USTA. We developed this great friendship and, and, you know, the USTA is a big organization, a very slow moving organization. And, and uh, you know, I had all these big goals. I'm 20 something years old and, and I had all these big goals and, I was constantly told, settle down, you know, it's going to take time. And uh, one of the persons that I became close with then um, got a job with the International Tennis Federation in, in London. And so we were inviting people to our U.S. Open. We had a, we had a United States Open National Wheelchair Tennis Championships that was in the Radcliffe of Irvine every year. It was our last tournament of the year. And it was there where we had our international meetings and our national meetings all throughout that tournament. As the, the sport was growing, um, you know, people would come from Europe, we would have these meetings. And we had people from the USTA um, and even had um, people from the International Tennis Federation starting to come to our meetings just as witnesses and, and just as kind of advisors and assistants. And then one day, um, the International Tennis Federation said they were going to hire a person. They're going to call it the executive secretary for um, the for wheelchair tennis. And we had this at the time. We had an international wheelchair tennis federation. So we hired um, uh, Ellen Delonga, who still works for the ITF. And um, you know, our some of our goals and plans was to um, become part of the Paralympics, and then eventually, um, you know, grow the game internationally. We never expected really it to, to completely be taken over by the International Tennis Federation and the different national organizations. We just didn't, you know, this is in the late 80s, and we had no idea where it was going to go. And, and uh, but um, then we had um, our first Australian Open championships which was held at the site of the Australian Open and it was held 
I think about a month before the Australian Open was held. And I think it was really through that that um, it eventually became then part of the Australian Open. Once we had the Australian Open and we had the top, top probably eight players in the men originally, and then we invited the women, eventually quads came a part of it, which is our three, three different divisions. Once we became part of the Australian Open, it just slowly progressed. Then the US Open brought us in. And then by that time, we were, our foundation no longer existed. We were part of the USTA. We were part of internationally, we were part of the International Tennis Federation. And in Australia, we were part of the Australian Tennis Association. And then it just grew from there. Wimbledon was, was slow to come along. I mean, we didn't even know if we could play on grass. And we had started out with doubles and then eventually singles and then eventually even the quads came in. So there was a progress on each level. And then of course, France uh, is the same way. France came in and, and you know, we, be, we didn't know if we could even really play proficiently on clay, especially in singles. Although we, we, were, we did have clay in, um, in Barcelona um, during the Paralympics, but you know, we, you know, a lot of this stuff was new and we, and it just kind of progressed kind of through that, but it was through the, um, Ellen and the, uh, our, um, the fact that we were part of the International Tennis Federation that that all happened. Alex, if I can just ask a question. Uh, sure. So Brad, um, you know, here in the U.S., tennis, thanks to you and, and hockey that, you know, the, the, as the NGBs, the national governing bodies, they've, they've certainly done a, a much better job at being inclusive, but for other sports currently, this is still a definite struggle. So I'm curious what advice you might have. And, and similarly, Sir Philip Craven, you know, we know right now there's about six countries by my count that have national Olympic and Paralympic committees that are inclusive. And I'm curious what your thoughts are um, of that from, from that level from, of the organization as well. So I'm wondering if you could respond. Do you want me to go first or? Sure, sure. Go ahead, Brad. Well, for us, it was, you know, I had said it was developing the relationships with these organizations and, um, you know, it takes time. And, you know, we had no expectations. We always thought we would be, I always thought we'd be a separate organization. Wheelchair tennis would be run by wheelchair tennis. I never even thought we'd be in Paralympics. So I never had these grandiose ideas from the very beginning. It was always a, a dream, but when we first started the organization, tennis was not part of the Olympics. So that changed everything. But I think it's to develop the relationships and, and in some organizations, you may have to do it slow depending on it. And, and I think today with you know the desire for organizations to be inclusive, I know the USGA is very proud of their involvement with wheelchair tennis. And you know it was a struggle in the in back in the early days when we were trying to develop that relationship, and and uh, now it's it's just a part of the game, and it's it seems like it's just very natural, and I and I love it, and I love the fact that the Paralympics and the Olympics, I think just recently have signed something or they've announced the name, even the name change was and to me is a just a massively huge thing for for disabled sports. But Phil can probably, Philip, you can elaborate yeah. on that. You're, you're part of that whole thing. Phil, you were, uh, right, you were, uh, you were elected as uh, president of the International Paralympic Committee in 2001. Yeah. Uh, we were in Athens at the time. And I happen to remember because I was sitting about one chair away from you when the election uh, uh, results were announced. And I uh, thought I was pretty much going to get knocked over because you were, uh, you were, you were so fired up. Um, and uh, so building on what Angeli said, I think it's pretty clear just from this interview that you are, uh, let me use the word focused. People might say headstrong as one of the words here, but certainly one who is not shy about uh, uh, giving your opinion and your uh, story. So uh, yeah. well, responding to Angeli's question, please. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction there, Paul. And um, and for the question, just before I get on to it, I'd just like to, not that I've ever been to the University of Illinois, of course, the games in 84, the wheelchair games should have been there. Well, there was some dodgy business with money that caused that not to happen. But um, 
but true. what I, the person I want to mention from there, though, is Tim Nugent, the Dr. Tim Nugent, of course, who he was Stan Labanovich's tutor, and he was absolutely the, the number one individual in getting the National Wheelchair Basketball Association moving in 1949. And so whenever anybody, anybody talks about wheelchair basketball, Tim Nugent is the, is the man. And, uh, and I, I just double-checked things on my other phone here uh, before I uh, came up on this, and I put founder of the NWBA, and uh, bang, it appeared from Google, uh, Timothy Nugent. So I, I like, as I'm we're speaking in the good old US of A, uh, I thought he should get a mention. But um, yeah, what about this thing of uh, Olympics and Paralympics? Or, you know, and, and we've heard there from Brad about, uh, I'd say, the successes and the difficulties of uh, wheelchair tennis is growth. But, and, and that is quite natural. And uh, I work for Toyota now uh, in Japan. And, um, and when I was getting to know the president, Akio Toyota, I, t I said to him, I said, life's a fight. And uh, not all the time. And he said, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, uh, you've got to fight for what you believe in. And therefore, if I am a little bit, you said, maybe headstrong, it's only when things are wrong and they have to be put right. And, um, and, and I think that that's where it came from. And, uh, it, and, and again, that comment from Brad about with some people and some situations, things progress quickly. And it, with other things, they, they don't progress as quickly. And at times you think you're not making any progress. But normally, well, progress has to happen between people. And so you have to write, find the right people for, for that to happen. Sometimes they're just presented in front, they present themselves to you. But I think that that's what's happened. And uh, if we look at, um, I didn't even know the statistics, uh, Angeli, uh, with regard to there are six uh, NOCs and NPCs now that are, that are joint. And I can think of probably the majority of them. Um, but I remember, I can't remember the guy's name now from Covington and Burling, but he undertook the big review of the USOC around 2010. I know I was interviewed in Vancouver during those games by him. Uh, Paul somebody, I think, I can't remember his name, damn. Um, but it doesn't matter. Uh, his report uh, recommended to the USOC that it should cut its board from, I think, nearly 100 members down to something more manageable. Uh, and I think now it's uh, somewhere just above 10. But also the second recommendation was that the USOC should start to recognize and work far more closely with the Paralympics because that was one thing that was going to grow very very fast in the future and so it was just great to see that it's now the us opc and uh, and it's a natural thing but it's not a natural thing in every country and uh, one thing that forget about me but wheelchair basketball kicked off in the states and it was run by the players for the players and of course then more people get involved and i think wheelchair tennis was started by players i think that's what happens with most sports actually and, and, and so, um, so what am I trying to say here? Uh, I've lost my train of thought. I think, now, you, should tell us, I think you should tell us that uh, uh, about uh, yeah, yeah. when you became the, uh, the president of the IPC and then uh, became a member of the board of the IOC and yeah. you helped drive that, uh, that recognition forward. You yeah. were the but key I think what I was going to say. Just before I go on to that, it was the key thing is you start something, you have an idea and things start to progress, but, but you, you must always stay uh, in control of your own destiny, if you can, to a, a greater or maybe slightly lesser degree. It depends on how things move. But and it, I, I don't mean the individual needs to be in charge but your sport needs to be in charge of its own development. And don't think that others will do it for you because they won't. You've got to do it for yourself with the support of others. And therefore, that's why, yes, in some countries at the moment, it would be suitable for the, the Olympic and Paralympic uh, uh, committees to come together and work together. Uh, but in others, they're not ready for that yet, maybe. But always make sure that Paralympics, by coming together, with any other organization, not necessarily an NOC, doesn't go from being reasonably important to the bottom of the pile. 
and I think that that can be a, a danger as well. But uh, but that's not what happened with me. But when I got elected, and you said I nearly knocked you over, well, uh, when I when we got the results there in Athens, uh, that was not a. It wasn't a very pleasant moment, really. It was great to know that I won, but there've been so many efforts made to make sure that I didn't win, uh, and I won't mention any names. But that was the truth. When I phoned my wife up shortly after, oh, and each of the four candidates the day before had been given an A4 sheet of paper telling you what would happen if you were successful in getting elected. And what happened was, and, and what would have happened would have been that the outgoing president would have invited the, uh, the successful candidate up onto the stage uh, to say a few words, uh, positive words about the out outgoing president, which I would have loved to do. Uh, sign the certificate for the Paralympic order for the outgoing president and then let the outgoing president uh, uh, bring the, uh, the General Assembly to a conclusion. Anyway, I never, got I never even got invited up onto the stage. And, um, and, uh, and when I phoned my wife, she said, I don't believe you've been elected because I'm sure you would have been stabbed in the back. And so those can be situations. So how do you move on from there? And, and because I was president of IPC from 2001, December, um, it was a recent right, in inverted commas, although you still needed to be elected, that, you know, that the president would become a, a member of the IOC. And, and really, that's like boy, uh, joining a club, really. And you don't get to know anybody, probably for a, for a very few, for a couple of years. There are 100 members. And so it, it takes time again. And you, you, people are always watching you. That's what I tell younger people now who want to become presidents or whatever they want to become. Don't think that uh, you're not being watched. You're being watched all the time. And it's not just what you say, but it's how you are in different environments. And so we were able to build a reasonable relationship. But the, I, the general IOC view uh, of the IPC was that it was truly disabled people playing sport and so that had to be changed over time and I think we really came together I would think with the IOC prior to Beijing those were your first games Angeli as, as I've learned and uh, and I think Beijing was the Barcelona 92 were amazing and that showed the potential but Beijing was the first highly successful games from a TV point of view and all that sort of thing and then that moved on to uh, on to um, London, but it's um, it, it's getting to know people, getting their trust, and the, then them trusting you, and moving forward together. And I think I think that's what it's all about. That's what life's all about, and that's what sport. Why sport is this amazing vehicle for anybody in the world, any child, to to be a vehicle for their own personal development. You may not go on to. Uh, you know, compete internationally or even nationally. But but when done in the right manner, uh, it teaches you so many things about life itself. I remember you uh, you spoke about uh, 1984. 1984, the games were in the United States in Los Angeles. And that was the first time, at least that I can remember, that there was a, at least a wheelchair track exhibition uh, uh, at those games in, uh, in, in LA, however, and that was the first, as I understand it, the first Olympic games that made money, that uh, yeah. set a number of foundations in place, which allowed for the growth of uh, the Olympic movement in the United States. But the US was supposed to host also the Paralympic games, and it was to be at the University of Illinois, but for a number of reasons that didn't happen, and the UK stepped in and uh, hosted the games uh, across a number of venues um, mm -hmm. near the Stoke Manville Center. Yeah. I remember because that was one of the first uh, uh, first opportunities to coach internationally. I was the powerlifting U.S. powerlifting team coach. Yeah. But I think just just to come back to Los Angeles and the Olympics, of course, the reason why, and it was Juan Antonio Samaran. He gets a bad press on as president of the IOC, you know, uh, on a number of issues maybe, but he, there was something he knew, he had a soft spot for the Paralympics. And so when the organizers of the LA Olympics in 84 would not stage 
the Paralympics. That was the original request. Then he, in some way, insisted that there should be these two uh, wheelchair track events, 800 metres for women and 1,500 metres for men. And, and that continued until uh, the Athens Games in 2004. And then after that, the Paralympics was growing and it was felt that it was no longer required uh, to be in the Olympics. But, um, but uh, yeah, so that, so that was another uh, uh, area of support uh, from Samaranj. And also that continued with Jack Rock uh, because he was elected in June 2001 when I was elected as president of the IOC uh, when I was elected president of IPC in, uh, in December. 2001. So we had sort of concurrent terms in a way. So, uh, Angeli, tell us uh, which games did you uh, participate in? What were your events? Tell um, us about your experiences. Yeah, so I, I competed in Beijing and London and I was a sprinter. So I did the 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, and some of our relays as well. Were there any uh, manholes in the uh, lane that you had to be careful of? <laughs> <laughs> there were not. No, no. <laughs> London was a great set of games, uh, Bill. I know that uh, you were on the, the board of the London games at the Times, and uh, this was just just a tremendous set of games, both uh, from a competitive point of view and for a, a celebration of the athlete's point of view. And I think that a lot of programs in London uh, uh, in the UK continue to flourish because of that. Yeah, they did. And... Um... Um, yeah, and uh, I, I would say that London was the first organising committee that, that really embraced the Paralympic Games in a similar manner to the Olympic Games. Beijing did that, but they did it quite late in the day. But we still had great, great games there. But in London, uh, that was definitely the case, and it was the first time ever that uh, if... Uh, the London Organising Committee was approaching a, a potential sponsor, then if that sponsor wasn't interested in the, in the Paralympics as well, then London wasn't interested in that sponsor. And, and so that was the sort of support that we had. And, uh, and they, they became, well, you know, I, it's not easy for me to say this. As a, I, I try not to be from the UK. I want to be international. But they were amazing games i mean you were there so i mean uh, you either agree with that or not and uh, and i remember in the swimming i was in the swimming uh, uh, hall uh, with the president or whatever his title was of the chinese uh, paralympic committee and we were watching an event and uh, and of course the games have been great in beijing but he turned to me and you might think it's not normal of say a, a man who's quite high up the hierarchy of, in in china but he turned to me, he said, mm, he said, there's something really special about these games. And, uh, and that was, you know, the man who staged the games four years before. And so it was, it was special. We had a lot of, how do you say, the planets were in alignment. I think that's what we can say. I think so. I think. What else would we like to speak about? Well, I can, I just can just add, um, you know, something I was thinking of when Philip was talking to, um, about, you know, just a few minutes ago about how, um, you know, I, I, anyway, I, I just got this, this thought came, came forward to me when, when we became part of the International Tennis Federation, we never, we, we didn't, you know, I always felt that we need to run our sport that, you know, we need to run wheelchair tennis and it wasn't going to happen unless we did that. But when the ITF came to us, they wanted to help and they wanted to be a part of, of wheelchair tennis and wheelchair tennis to be a part of that organization. We never begged them. And the USTA came to us. And the same thing with um, the, um, you know, participation in the Grand Slams. We never, you know, originally when we first started our relationship with the USTA, I, they asked me, you know, different things. Well, what do you guys want? What do you want from the USTA? What would you like? And one of the things was we would love to have an exhibition during the US Open. We thought that would be just tremendous exposure in the early part of our sport. And they said, Brad, that's never going to happen. 
And then you look today and it's like, we're part of the Grand Slams. We're, we play and compete in the Grand Slams. And this year, because of COVID, they had to, they eliminated um, certain aspects. They eliminated all the junior players from playing in the US Open. So the US Open is not just the best players in the world. Second week, they have um, a, a senior division, 35 and over players who are retired. They come and play doubles and um, they have the wheelchair tennis. And then they also have the juniors, the top ranked juniors in the world compete. And that's been a part of the US Open forever. This year, they only had the, the, the wheelchair tennis and the, um, you know, of course, the top pros because of COVID. So it's, I mean, it's just nice to see that, you know, I mean, we never had to beg for that. It just kind of happened naturally through relationships. And, and I just kind of wanted to add that uh, when Anjali uh, asked that question. I think that picking on what you said and what Phil said about uh, the, the athletes uh, giving back after they've gone through their, com uh, completed their competitive time where they take uh, responsibility and initiative toward achieving their own uh, ends. When they're the leadership of the sport, it's not folks watching persons with disabilities compete. It's the persons with disabilities that are now taking control of it. They have the message, they are the image, uh, they're the ones that drive the, uh, the improvement of the sport and the recognition of the sport. Absolutely. Angela, you're into personal, you're into uh, organizational development. So you probably have a more elegant way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it, I think you're all saying important pieces. I, I think that the um, being from from my generation too, it, it's it's that balance of wanting to honor the history of like where, where we ended up, but also wanting to speed things up a little bit and and wanting to wanting to see see this uh, you know to really to really be able to take off. But but I think that we've seen we've seen tremendous growth and 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 I'm excited to see kind of where where we do end up. I mean you know to Brad to your point, I mean the 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 renaming of the U.S. Olympic and and Paralympic Committee was a huge moment. I serve currently um, finishing out my term on the Athlete Advisory Committee for the USOPC. And so to be there for that, for, for that historic vote on, on, on our end and then to witness the board voting it in was, was really remarkable. I think for me, one of the most, the coolest part about that whole experience and, and was seeing the, the tremendous support from our Olympians for this. So we sort of thought that we were going to have to make the case and like and really you know and 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 all of this but the cool part was that many people dr blowett being one of those um, many individuals um you know had helped to really pave the way to to it was time for that vote and 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 that was what that being in that room really showed me um which was really really a remarkable thing sorry brad you, uh... i was gonna say a couple of years ago to that note kind of what angelie was saying a couple of years ago i was at a um the Legends Ball, which is a fundraiser for the International Tennis Hall of Fame. It's held during the US Open, um, one of the last nights. And Martina Nevertolova was receiving an award from the Hall of Fame. And so she got up and spoke and she was talking about the highlights of her year. And her two highlights of the year was she had a chance to hit tennis balls with Jimmy Connors. And she had a chance to play tennis with Esther Vigier. And that hit me so strongly thinking she's up here with all the big wigs really of, of tennis. And she's speaking and says the highlight of her year was playing with Esther Vigier. And, uh, and that's the relationship that Esther and a lot of the top wheelchair tennis players today have with the top players in the game is remarkable. They have these great relationships and um, and, and that's sport is just becoming all it's just sport so it's all we're all together now and, and or it's we're, we're reaching those levels I mean with the Olympics and the naming of the uh, the new name of the Olympics um, and you know with tennis being a part of it I mean it's all just coming together as sport and it's fantastic If I can just add, 
it's it's definitely coming together, but we still need the fighters there when when fights need to be fought because um, because it's we're, it'll it'll never be perfect. And it's yeah. never perfect for anybody. We've got to accept that uh, what is what is. But uh, when when something needs to be improved, then we need somebody to step up and say, "I'm going to do that." And and that's what's happened. Uh, what is it now? How long is it now? It's uh, 70, it's nearly 70 years since that first uh, event took place at Stoke Mandeville, you know, and, uh, um, and a lot's happened since then. Mm -hmm. as, you, as, as those of you that can see that are viewing this panel, you can see we've got three distinct personalities here uh, uh, among our guests in, in approaches. Uh, so, and it's that type of mix, I think, that has uh, advanced uh, the sport uh, to uh, where it needs to go. So, um, parting words from each, I think that we've covered. Is there anything that we haven't covered that uh, uh, one of you would like to share? Parting words. Angelique? I think just, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited to, to have, an, you know, th those that are listening to learn a little bit more about the Paralympics and about disability sport and, and hope that this uh, conversation excites you to, to follow some of the action um, over, the, over these next few years. Appreciate that. And you did mention the fact that Sherry Blowett was going to be on the panel and, uh, and come and speak to us. Brad? Well, I, I just love our, the history of, um, of wheelchair sports. I love everything about it. And I, I've been a part of it to a certain degree, not as long as, as you and, and Philip have, but I love hearing the stories and I love and admire those who came before me um, and what they, the difficulties that they went through. And I appreciate it when the younger athletes feel that the same way towards me and um, and uh, yeah, we all have different approaches to things. I mean, I, Anjali, I, I love um, your contributions to this uh, um, um, panel that we had today and the things, the questions that you asked and the things that you had said, and, you know, it's a completely different perspective. And, and I look at Phil, Philip and, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, um, your fieriness that, you know, I would never have known if Paul hadn't have mentioned it. I, um, I just have admired you for many years. And, and he dropped me right in it there. Anyway, carry on, yeah. <laughs> well, what you've accomplished, and uh, you do it with such class. So um, it's uh, um, you're doing it obviously the right way. And and uh, um, Paul, I competed in the the '92 Olympic game, Paralympic games, and and uh, so um, I don't. I, I I know we we've met many times over the years. I mean, not just briefly and n never really gotten to know you as well. And it's been, but uh, I knew you were the, the chef de Michonne there and, and it was great to compete in those games. I, I loved it very much. And, and uh, um, anyway, I just appreciate what everyone, what you all are, are doing and your contributions that you've made to, uh, to our sport. So thank you guys for um, allowing me to be a part of this. Phil, since you're so focused, I give you the opportunity to close this out. Well, thanks. And um, uh, well, firstly, I'd just like to go back to Barcelona in 92 because I retired as a basketball player in uh, in uh, Seoul uh, four years before that. And uh, and I always still say, despite London, I still say that Barcelona were, were the games that made the biggest difference to the Paralympic movement. And uh, maybe it was because you two were there at the time. Who knows? But um, but really, I'd like to add to what Brad said about what a pleasure it's been to be with uh, the three of you uh, today. And to close, I'd just like to say that I think I may have, I, I'm not a very good counter, but I think that Anjali has used the word excited at least four times, if not five. And a little story about that. So we were working on, uh, on the vision for the IPC back in 2002, and we'd written down to enable para-athletes to achieve sporting excellence and inspire the world. And then myself and the CEO had a, um, some um, 
media training. And we were terrible on these toy phones, you know, uh, and we got ripped to shreds by this guy. It was very good that we did actually, because it, it proved worthwhile the following week. But we then had a, a bit of a, a whiteboard session and he said, well, what, what, does, what does it do to you, the Paralympics? I said, it excites me. He said, I like that. And he, I said, I'm putting that up on the board. And the day after I put it into the vision. And so it didn't finish and inspire the world but it was and in, inspire and excite the world and and that's what we're about that's what sport's about it's exciting people about what others do i think so uh, and it's just been such a pleasure being with you uh, this afternoon or this morning uh, if you're in the usa uh, thank you phil What is your perspective on the opportunities or lack of opportunities for people with disabilities to participate fully in sports and have access to the adaptive equipment or resources they might need to pursue sports at a competitive level? And what needs to be improved in this area? Well, first and foremost, I think that we have to begin to change our mindset around access to adaptive sports and thinking and start to think about it more so from the lens of universal design um, and universal access. Right now, um, the norm is that, you know, there are, of course, many fantastic programs that exist across the country, but most young people with disabilities or adults as well um, really have to seek out the opportunities. They have to do a lot of hard work, you know, digging, asking around um, in order to find out where the opportunities are or, they may get lucky and be right place, right time, and someone will tell them about it, for example. Um, but for many people, it takes far too long to learn about adaptive sports. Broad swaths of the disability community still are not aware or understand what opportunities are out there. And so we, have to, we have to start thinking about changing our mindset and, and thinking about it more so from the lens of universal design where we consider adaptive sports to be built into um, an inclusive mindset built into more mainstream programs at all levels. Um, and that'll take a shift and it takes some significant work, but I think it's really where the community needs to head. I think the best example is schools and school-based opportunities where, um, of course, there are some schools around the country, some school districts that are doing a wonderful job of building in inclusive opportunities, but many of them, most schools still are doing very little. and. Um, that creates a, a, a context where young people um, with disabilities have to look outside of their school system and find these specialty adaptive sports programs in the community. Ideally, their initial exposure to sport should be through their school as it is for every other child in this country. Um, and and uh, if we can shift that mindset and, and achieve that, then we'll be in a place where students with disabilities all understand what the opportunities are, and then they can decide if they're interested or not, rather than having to strongly claim their interest and then go seek out the opportunity. And I think that's the big shift that we need to make. Um, some sports are more um, geared towards that, or it will be easier to facilitate in certain sports, for example, individual sports like track and field or swimming, where you don't need a lot of ex you know, expensive equipment and you can integrate students with disabilities fairly seamlessly um, in the team. Uh, some team-based sports are a little bit more difficult and probably require more working across school districts, so something like wheelchair basketball, for example. Um, and so, so I think that I think that shifting our mindset towards universal design concepts of universal design is really what will ultimately move the needle on that and where we need to head. As a physician, have you encountered barriers for yourself personally or for your patients? related to having a disability and interacting with the healthcare system? Yeah, so, you know, the healthcare system still uh, presents a multitude of barriers to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. I've certainly encountered it myself, um, and it's something that I always am um, talking about and, uh, you know, trying to, trying to take up as an advocacy um, priority within my own work. So much of it is because our entire healthcare system is built out of the medical model of disability. And that's been the case for decades, if not centuries, where we think about people with disabilities primarily through a medical lens and think about them being defined by their diagnosis and their disability being defined by that diagnosis, 
rather than a more progressive model of disability and thinking about it from a more civil rights or human rights framework where we understand that people's disability is really defined by their environment and the environmental barriers and attitudinal barriers that they face. And so because the medical model was born out of the medical community, <laughs> even though across our broader society and culture, we've shifted to more of a human rights model, um, we still have a lot, in, a lot of catching up to do in medicine and healthcare. Um, and, you know, I think <clears throat> there are both, there, you know, there are challenges, but also very salient opportunities. Um, you know, for example, one thing that is shifting and needs to continue to change is the way we frame disability within our medical school curriculum um, or in the curriculums of other health professions like nursing, physical therapy, et cetera. Um, and from the start, when we educate our trainees and our future clinicians, um, talking about disability from the human rights model from the beginning. Um, and there's some great examples in schools where that's happening, but it's not happening enough. And it's certainly not something that's a ubiquitous part of training programs and curriculums. Um, and of course, it's important to, to set the right mindset from, from a very early point with our future professionals. Um, as it relates to you know, access to healthcare environments, um, I think about it from multiple different lenses. There are challenges related to physical access, um, but also communications access, digital access. You know, digital access is becoming even more important as we are in the time of COVID and everything is progressively more virtual in nature, including healthcare. Um, and so, so um, part of what we've been trying to do here in Boston and in our, our Harvard and Mass General Brigham system is trying to integrate considerations around disability within the broader health equity framework. And so when we think about providing equitable care to communities of color, to older patients, to people who English is not their preferred language, to immigrant communities, et cetera, that we also build in disability into that work so that when we're thinking about access from an equity lens, we understand that disability is a really important component of that. Um, and that disability is very intersectional with all those others that I listed. Um, and that if you wanna be successful in improving healthcare access for communities of color that you have to bring disability along with that in order to be successful. Um, so those are some of the areas of growth. I think that on the whole, the medical community, we're, we're in such a better place now than we were even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but there's still a lot of work to do. So I think we're in a place where we should be proud of where we've come, um, but also know that we can't stop here and need to keep working. Are adaptive sports something that's only available to young people on a regular basis if they're willing to travel? and have family support, and could K-12 through schools and local adult leagues make modifications to be more inclusive, or do sports that include people with disabilities need to stand alone as separate events? Um, well, ultimately, I think that both components are really important. Um, the first portion of that question related to um, integration of sports in K-12 through schools and adult leagues, that really gets at the initial point that I made around universal design, and I think that, I think that we do need to increase access in those settings. Um, to particularly and most importantly to increase exposure to adaptive sports. You know, just like within the general community, not everybody wants to play sports. Not everybody is into sports or wants to have an athletic identity. But for those who do want it, we have to increase um, opportunities for that initial entry point. And that's where I think the schools and the mainstream sport leagues are really important. Um, and even if schools or these mainstream sport leagues don't have a full spectrum of opportunity or a full adaptive sports program, even if they have something or even if they have a mechanism to be more inclusive and open their doors and open their programming towards people with disabilities, it's a really important entry point and a really important starting point. Then I think coupled with that and in parallel, you still need disability specific adaptive sports programs because they are critical in offering the sports specific training and the technical expertise that's needed to um, assist people with disabilities in getting involved with the sport, but also increasing their talent, right? And training and learning the ropes and moving up that pipeline, so to speak, if, you know, if that's where they wanna head. Um, and also disability specific adaptive sports programs are incredibly important for um, culture and thinking about um, opportunities for peer mentoring and the importance of that connection that athletes create with one another, athletes with disabilities create with one another, that is so critically important for, um, for mentoring and for building confidence and for 
um, having a positive disability self-identity through sport. So I think that both, I think that both are critically important. Um, and I think that of the two that, that are disability specific adaptive sports programs are better in this country are better developed than the more mainstream programs. And that's why I continue to emphasize that I think we need to try to balance that better, build up and emphasize the mainstream programs more, and then couple that with the disability specific adaptive sports programs. Can you please talk about your Paralympic career and the changes you've been a part of as a member of the Olympic Committee the last few years? Yeah, so I um, got involved in adaptive sport when I was in middle school um, and tried multiple sports, but eventually really um, uh, gleaned onto the sport of wheelchair racing. And over several years and with a lot of hard work, um, rose up the ranks and um, eventually continued to acquire skill and talent and um, had the pleasure of competing for Team USA in three Paralympic Games, Sydney, Athens, and Beijing, um, and bringing home seven medals. Um, as I know, many of the other panelists are also Paralympic medalists, so I'm not alone in that, um, in that accomplishment. So um, as I was progressing through my athletic career, I also didn't give up on my academic career. And I was initially an undergrad at the University of Arizona and then progressed to uh, attend medical school at Stanford. And while I was in my medical training, that was also really the peak of my athletic career. And so even before I retired from sport, I was already thinking about how could I bridge my athletic accomplishments and my athletic career into a mechanism for maintaining involvement in the movement beyond competing. Um, Initially, I found that opportunity through working with the International Paralympic Committee and serving on their medical commission, initially as the athlete member, and then bridging to be a general member. Um, and that was a an fantastic entry point because it enabled me to you know, build expertise as a leader and bring my medical training to the table and have that really unique blended lens of being a Paralympic athlete and also a physician. Um, from there, and, and I still am involved in that group, from there, I also became involved here in the U.S. and in 2017 began a term, my first term as a member of the um, board of directors of the U.S. Olympic Committee, which is now the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And in that role, you know, have had the tremendous honor of really being involved in conversations and being at the table when we contemplate some of the big decisions that have really been transformative to the Paralympic movement in this country. Um, the two that stand out are um, an, a decision in 2018 to shift the medal payment structure so that Olympians and Paralympics, excuse me, Olympians and Paralympians are awarded the same payment for winning a gold, silver, or bronze medal, um, and that there's equity in that payment system. Uh, prior to that, Paralympians were making, I think, something like about 20% of what were Olympians were making for winning a gold medal. Um, and that obviously was not, was no longer seen as being acceptable or equitable. Um, the other big decision um, was in 2019 when um, uh, there was increasing recognition of the fact that we were missing an opportunity um, in simply in the name of our organization. Um, and that if we transition from being the U.S. Olympic Committee to the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, that we would, with that simple change, um, you know, make a lot of progress with regards to overall Paralympic awareness across the U.S., which then, of course, dovetails into so many other good things and opportunities. So that transpired in June of 2019, and it was another really proud moment for the Paralympic movement here in the U.S. Um, and I'd say on the whole that those two decisions are really indicative of a broader culture shift within our movement, and that um, that moving forward, that the mindset towards inclusion and the mindset that we're really all part of one team is just, it's vastly different than it was, frankly, even five years ago, certainly only 10 years ago, and we're really in a new era um, of Paralympic inclusion, particularly as we think about heading into um, hosting the Games in Los Angeles in 2028, and uh, with a firm commitment from the organizing committee that we will have a phenomenal Olympic and Paralympic Games um, and be able to show the world uh, everything that we've got in that regard. So it's been a really exciting time and, um, and a, lot, a lot more to come. Um, over the next eight years now as we head into Los Angeles.
Hey, great day, everybody. I am so excited to be with you today. I can't believe we're in this Zoom room on the, on the room where it happens, the room where it happens. <laughs> so listen, um, this is a great topic because one of these things, we, when we talk about sports and disability, it's really an interesting intersection that, that comes to light and brings out a lot of um, kind of what we think about in general society, what we think about in a lot of uh, places that we show up and how do we show up and what's kind of the appropriate thing. So a little bit of background about myself so you know how I got into the space of disability sport in the first place. Uh, at 529 in the afternoon on May 17th, 1994, I was one of the fastest hurdlers in the United States of America. I was trying to make the Olympic team. Um, I was a person that was on, had been a four-time track and field All-American at the University of Arkansas. I twice went to the Olympic trials in the hurdles, once in the 110 meter high hurdles and another time in the 400 meter hurdles. I was in the United States Army um, on my way to officer candidate school, getting ready to you know, serve my country for another 20 years. And I, I was on gravy train because I was gonna work 20 years as a military officer, come back and work the same job that I got out and, and then do a double retirement and just travel the world. That was kind of my plan, become an Olympian, become an officer, travel the world. But at 5.30, my whole world changed with one wrong step. I went across a hurdle, training for the 400 meter hurdles. Uh, it's 1994, it's about two years prior to the Olympic games. I am on the Army's world-class athlete program track and field team, and I go across this hurdle. I land awkwardly. I snap my left leg in half. It hyperextends. And as I fall forward, there's a disruption that happens to the popliteal artery behind the kneecap. And as I lay there on the ground, I realize that all of my dreams, what I thought was going to happen, were over. Full stop. And seven days later, I woke up in a hospital in Wichita, Kansas, with my wife holding my right hand, my parents on the left side of the bed, and my son, John Jr., five and a half years old, at the foot of the bed. And the pain was excruciating. And Dr. Mullins walks into the room. He's my doctor that time. And he says, John, you got a tough decision to make. You can either keep your leg or use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life, where I can amputate your leg and you can use a prosthesis for the rest of your life. Now, what kind of choice is that? And it was really my, uh, my male deductive reason that spoke because I was in so much pain. <laughs> it said, you know what, John, if you get rid of your leg, you'll get rid of the pain. And I looked back at Dr. Mullins and I said, Doc, I know it needs to be amputated. And he went right into work. Two days later, my left leg was amputated above the knee, and I woke up from that surgery at 11 o'clock at night in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reasoned. <laughs> and I just wanted something to knock it out. There was a morphine drip button on the side, but I was too weak to roll over to depress that button. And I could see the nurses right outside my door, but the tubes that were down my throat made the sound to an audible to get their attention. So there I lay in that bed for the next eight hours with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What's my identity? Will my wife still stay with me? Will my son still see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the United States Army? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. And at about eight o'clock, Dr. Mullins comes back in the room and sees I've done a 180 degree shift. He immediately calls my wife, Alice, who's over at the hotel, trying to manage herself, myself, John Jr., her mother-in-law, father-in-law, and she just found out that morning that because she was with me, had taken off work from where she was working in, in, the, in the state of Arkansas, her job had just fired her for being away with her husband who was injured, soldier. She comes running over. This saint of a woman takes, and Dr. Mullins takes 45 minutes to get me out of the bed into a chair, a wheelchair, wheeled out to an inaccessible playground where I'm parked there watching my boy and my wife play on the swing sets. And I couldn't push myself out of that chair. It was the first time I felt devalued, 
dejected, disabled. And I lost it. I started crying uncontrollably. I just couldn't believe what was going on in my life at that moment. And then my wife, Alice, she comes running over to me as I'm sitting in the chair and she says to me, what is going on, John? And I began to articulate to her everything that was in my mind that I was, that I was thinking about the night before. And then she says the words that stop my downward spiral. You know what, John? We're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. And when she spoke those words, she baselined my entire existence. And as I thought about them, John Jr., he jumps off the swing, hits the ground, comes running over, says, hey, Dad, you see my big jump? You see my big jump, Dad? And in those 20 yards, he had just validated me as his father. And he had created his new normal. And I knew that's exactly what I had to do was to create that new normal. Now, most people use the new normal as kind of this destination point, right? We think about it as, well, when things get back to normal or when I get to normal, uh, when we're in the new normal, but that's not really how I was understanding and beginning to define the word or the, the, the phrase new normal. For me, the new normal was never a destination point. New means no prior point of reference. So if I can get my mind to think that there's no prior point of reference, don't think about life prior to the amputation. Think about life right now. We're in a COVID environment. Many people are struggling with the full stop, like I had in my life. And they're trying to figure out what normal looks like to them. What's the, what's the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or their action? And I believe in that space, we have to develop that, right? We have to push into that space. Developing it by getting a ritual, the ritual increasing a rhythm, the rhythm, rhythm elevating us to a rise in our life. So the new normal is not a destination. The new normal is only a plateau by which we grow. And that's what I was beginning to understand with sports and disability. I began swimming for physical therapy and I got so fast in the water that I fluked up, messed up and somehow made the Paralympic swim team. So instead of going to the, to the Olympic games, the 400 meter hurdles, I went to the parallel games, the Paralympic games as a swimmer. It was there I saw athletes on the track running and jumping with artificial limbs. I said, I got to get one of those made. And I ran and jumped after learning how to run again on an artificial limb and went over to Sydney, Australia and won the silver medal in Sydney. So I say all that to kind of tee up the conversation today for us on sports and disability. There was a lot of things I began kind of looking and understanding and working after swimming and, and understanding what Paralympics was all about because I didn't even know about this entity that started off in, in 1948 with Sir Ludwig Gutmann over in Germany for wounded, ill, and injured service members coming out of World War II and using sports as a part of the rehabilitation. What a visionary that's burst the Paralympic Games in 1960. And we begin to see the sporting community with people with disabilities giving people kind of another chance to, to get back to this healthy and this active lifestyle and that they could, they could do more than what was on the books of what was happening during that time. Many people that had spinal cord injuries at that time before Gutman's work, they were dying of their bed sores. They were dying in hospitals. And the sports, basketball at first, and then kind of gravitating out, really began to help those become active. And it still exists today, but I think the, the mission is greater than just kind of saving the lives on that. Maybe it saves the lives mentally, but we're, we're beyond, you know, the kind of the, the we should be beyond the bed sores and, and that type of, of, uh, of a thought process. So here are some of the things that I learned. I, I wrote down three of them. Uh, one, people with disabilities, when they are in sport, are often framed as superhumans. That was the first thing I was beginning to understand. And even in the disability community, people that were um, in the disability community kind of segmented out this population and said, oh, those are the, kind of the super crips. 
And I don't know if I really agree with that coming from both sides of the equation, right? Because I knew exactly how hard it was to train for the Olympic Games. And I trained equally as hard, if not harder, for the Paralympic Games. So I know there is an equal amount of time, energy, mental preparedness to win a medal or to try to, 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 to compete at your optimum. Uh, when you see these athletes, I think it's, we go through this process of what to wow, now how. We often will look at the Paralympic athlete in a, in a sport and we'll see videos of them and we'll say, um, it'll blow our minds. Why? Because we didn't think that was possible for a person. Because oftentimes what we do is we place what we believe a person can or cannot do based on what we believe we could or could not do if we were in their situation. And then when they blow our minds because they say, oh my gosh, I could never do what they're doing, then we go to, wow, that's amazing. We see a blind individual run underneath 12 seconds for a 100 meter dash. Wow, or 11 seconds, wow, I'm blown away. We see a blind person long jump over 22 feet, wow. But that person, is that a wow or is that they're just, just trying to do what they're normally doing, what they were designed to do? So the what to wow was the kind of mind blown. It's, it's a, I don't believe this is actually possible. Wow, it is possible. And they're doing it way better than I could do it. We can't stop there because we have to get into the now how. Now that I have this information, now that I know this information, what is now my responsibility to it? And how am I going to get it done? How will I do it? Now that I have a responsibility, how am I going to engage in the conversation? How am I going to push and elevate this conversation forward. So as you're listening as students or faculty or however you're coming into this conversation today, you have seen some things up to this point that probably got you going, that is amazing. That's incredible. So now that you have this information, how are you going to get it out and elevate it so that we begin to have a more equitable conversation around disability, using disability sports as maybe that, that baseline for it? there really is not a superhuman, right? People are just showing up as their fully authentic selves. And they're doing it at excellence because they've trained and they practice and they've rehearsed and they're, they've, they've gone and have what I call plus one days, training on days when no one else in their, um, in their event will train. So I'm gonna train in the rain, I'm gonna train the snow because I know my competitor won't do it. And they advance themselves so much that they make it look easy, just as LeBron James, when he shoots a, a, a three-point bucket, makes it look easy. Just like Serena Williams, when she, when she, uh, she drives in the ace on her opponent because she's shooting that ball or, or hitting that ball at 115, 120 miles an hour, it makes it look easy. We think that's incredible. But here's the deal. Why is it that LeBron James or Serena Williams, when they shoot or when they make that shot or hit that ball, why do we write them about them on the sports page? Well, the answer is because that makes sense. <laughs> when I first started doing uh, an event where I set a, a record in the, um, uh, the long jump for America with one leg, I thought I should be written about on the sports page too. But in America, we don't see disability like that. Where did I wind up? I wound up on the human interest page, on the, the metro section, on the lifestyle page, because the writers, they don't see disability sport, at least in America, as true sport. They see it as the quote unquote inspirational story. Let's inspire our audience. And I think that LeBron James or Serena Williams also inspire as well but we look at a person with a disability and we market them differently in the U United States. So we have to put that on um, equitable standing. I think it's appropriate to be, show up on a human interest page, so don't get me wrong, or a lifestyle page, if that's where the story fits. But when we're talking about a sports story, it also should be in the sports section because that measures apples and apples together. So think about that. Think about the times we look at on television and we are seeing uh, individuals with disabilities, where are they showing up? More commercials now than 10 years ago or even five years ago or three years ago 
are using athletes with disabilities or individuals with disabilities to market products in a way that kind of shows lifestyle and it shows it through the lens of their sport. So we see it in that capacity and we're beginning to see it in the U.S. market because it's selling more. It's, it's, it's the appropriate thing to do because it's, it's selling more. Don't, don't get them wrong. They're doing it because they're selling more widgets. Um, so I think that's an important point to make that uh, we're not superhuman and don't think that we're superhuman. We're just showing up. But if we're going to be superhuman, it's because we exercise and practice more than someone else in their, in their, um, in their event structure. Secondly, in the United States, we have a disparity in valuing, in valuing this population, uh, the disability population. So we're, we're in 8830 right now, right? So that's the American with Disabilities Act 30th anniversary. It was signed into law in, the in 1990 by George H.W. Bush. And we see that we have physical uh, barriers have been reduced, uh, not a lot that are out there. And we see then that reduction that they really, the physical barriers help a lot of people, not just people with disabilities. Think about the last time you rode your bicycle up a curb cutout. Think about the last time that you had your cell phone, right? And you were texting somebody. Well, the text function feature came because of people that had auditory problems and couldn't hear, put, put the phone through their, their ear to listen. And now we text all the time. And now we do voice to text because we don't have to, to use our, our hands to do it. So think about someone that doesn't have hands, maybe a military veteran that was injured in Iraq or Afghanistan or somebody was born without, uh, without hands. They can now use the, the voice tech to text feature and speak and communicate. So we find all of these are of use to us in a regular everyday market. We just don't think about it being first used for people with disabilities. But going back to the point that we don't value this population base is, when you look at the unemployment rate that happened in 1990, there was about, I think, 71.5% of people with disabilities were that could work, eligible to work, could not. And that number really hasn't moved 30 years later. Because of, because of what I used to call attitudinal barriers, I don't call them that anymore, because a great friend of mine, a mentor of mine, Judy Human, shifts the conversation. You have to look up Judy Human, look up Crip Camp on Netflix, amazing uh, documentary, one of the best Sundance film, one best picture for uh, the people's choice, right? Um, so look at that Crip Camp. But what we're talking about really is ableism. And so I want to show up as my full authentic self. And, you know, this this language that we're using, we have to understand how it works in society. So we don't value the population. We have things like uh, we look at the television and the number of hours. Uh, we are competing with sports like poker because that's a sport. <laughs> so that's why we don't really see it on television. We're competing with all these different markets in the United States, and that's okay. But producers don't value Paralympians to the degree that they are willing to push them ahead of poker and put them on television put us on television, put the games on television like that. Yes, we have the greatest number of hours that NBC ever put on for the, the winter games and the summer games, but it's not a household name yet because we're not like what I would say England. So here's what England did. When England and Channel 4 got together, they wanted to push and make sure that these games were on equal footing. So they really valued the games. And, and here's what they did. They made certain, they made sure that in these, these games that the commentators were all going to be people with disabilities. We don't do that in the United States. We have a few, we have a few tokens that we'll use that are out there, but the, primarily, the primary people that we use are those that don't have a disability. They're the, they're the anchors of the program. The Channel 4 couldn't find the people to be the anchors and the hosts and, and all. They had a few, but they didn't have everybody trained up. So they went and scoured all of GB to make sure that they trained up individuals to be on the television shows to lead the conversation. And we don't do that here in the United States. We don't have that. We don't, we don't put people with disabilities up front like that unless they kind of, quote, unquote, look the part or they have a great massive following on social media. And so that is something that we have to really look at on how we actually valuing. And even inside, when you look at people with disabilities and people of color, there is a whole another segment 
that is a part of that or a lack of a part of that when you look at the leadership even inside the disability community or who we showcase on television to kind of look the part we want to make sure that it's palatable to the audience member in the united states whereas in the uk they just train the people up that were those paralympic athletes or people with disabilities to actually have a more real authentic conversation and i think that's another thing between valuing or just tolerating uh, we want to be, be go beyond the toleration uh, i'm just going to put you in because i think that you're going to you'll look the part versus i'm going to put you in because you are valuable to me and the demographic that we're talking to so think about that the next time we're looking at um at that type of a of a value versus tolerance um uh, mindset to be fair we don't don't do tv like everybody else in the world we sell advertisements we sell rights so i want to make sure I'm, I'm equally balancing that out uh, because i do know our market is different at the same time you we 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 put our money where our our um our, our methodologies are our, our mindsets are and what we value so when we're valuing something we actually elevate that thing so i'm not going to let folks off the hook for not valuing us in that type of level uh, uh, love um, that the type of hierarchy because we want to be in the prime time we want to be on the on you know not just a special that comes on but actually showing the events like the, like the olympics are shown that's like the super bowl is shown and i think that's the equitable when you're looking at it from the standpoint of showcasing that in the united states and not being on late or not being on a tape show that comes on we want to see it in real time and watch like everyone else. And so that's another, when we're looking at the disparity between disability and disability sports, that is another one which we have to, to look at quite, um, uh, I think with a, a different lens in valuing uh, the, the games as such. And I, I do think it's coming up, so don't get me wrong. I do think it's, it's coming up in that. Um, so look at things like, Here's a, a resource to go out to. Look at the Yes, I Can video that Channel 4 did, I think it was. Uh, yes, I Can or Sports Doesn't Care Who You Are, that video that's out there. And look at those videos and see how the UK is doing it. And they're really leading the charge. And America is following, trying to hopefully follow that, that charge that they're doing. Uh, my work I've done with the Global Sport Mentoring Program, which is a program that is operated by the State Department and, and administered by the University of Tennessee, helps other individuals in other countries that are coming over to the United States to learn how to actually implement programs in their localities. So I, we had Yerlan Sumlinov uh, and Pimdi Bumali. Yerlan's from, uh, um, and from Uganda, and um, Yerlan is from uh, Kazakhstan. And so both of them have gone back and really elevated their programs on some things that we have helped and taught them. But one of the things that I think they're not learning from us, they're learning from Great Britain, is how to actually market better and, and value and appreciate people better in their hometowns there. And I really want to advance the United States in understanding the value and appreciation of people with disabilities. Think about this. The United Nations on the Convention of Rights of People with Disabilities um, the United States has not ratified that convention. And why is that? It's, I don't know why we have held up and stopped and not ratified that convention on a convention that was really written upon on the American with Disability Act's laws and rules. Um, and so I think it's just kind of ludicrous for us not to have ratified that where we're, uh, where everybody else in the world that we're trying to hold to a standard has. <laughs> so I think that's another thing that we often will not look at as as something that's that's um that's positive so the um judy human uh, like i mentioned her earlier she was on the trevor noah show and i think another kind of going on this this bent on uh value and appreciating right what why is this so she's on the trevor noah show and and uh there's a point in the in the conversation that happens and judy is probably the stalwart of the independent living movement and the disability rights movement. Uh, she is spectacular. Um, uh, like I said, watch Crip Camp. Um, when she's on the show, Trevor says something to the effect of, well, because me being able-bodied and Judy immediately kind of jumps in and says, I don't like that term because I would prefer that you refer to me as, or prefer, I would refer to you, Trevor, as temporarily able-bodied. And Trevor said, what are you threatening me? Are you threatening me? <laughs> uh, he says in jest, but that's just it. Oftentimes we think that people with disabilities 
have something that needs to be cured. And we look at sports as a cure to getting over the disability. And I don't believe we get over our disability, nor do I think we get over the things that we think we get over in life. So I want to share a quick slide with you and kind of just walk you through this little um, kind of this process that I, I, I've, I've kind of developed uh, in my understanding my own life and how I came through. I don't believe we overcome the disability. What I do believe we have overcome, right, is first of all, our negative stigma, the stigma that comes in. Why is my wife, is my wife going to stick around? Is my son going to see me as his dad? Am I going to keep my job in the military? Those were the st stigmas that I had that were on me as an individual. The second thing, though, is the stigma of others, other people believing for me what I can or cannot do, which is based on what they believe they could or could not do if they were in my situation. And then third, society, right? Who was I listening to in society that made me believe my fears in the first place? Who was it? Was it when I watched the Walt Disney movie? I'm six years old. I see Peter Pan. The villain of Peter Pan is Captain Hook. Captain Hook's a, he's an, a, a, above the um, wrist amputee. He wears the hook. He's dark. He's mysterious. He's scary because he has his hook. He's disfigured. But wait a minute. Now I'm the amputee. Is that why children will ask their mom and say, there goes Robot Man? And mom says, let's take them down a different aisle. No, it's impolite to stare. Get them away from there. And so society dictates to us what we, our belief systems are. and we, we choose to believe that. Think about why we believe what we believe. Those are the greatest questions that I ask individuals when we're talking about this type of topic. So there's a second bucket though. The second bucket has to deal with, we believe we're rebuilding. And I frame it this way. Had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. But I don't get that back. We don't get back what we think we get back. We don't get back pre-COVID. We don't get back kind of pre-George Floyd. We don't get back Breonna Taylor. We don't get back, we don't get those things back or relationship. What we have to do is begin to uh, have a different mindset. And now we're going to live courageously to actually amputate the fear that holds us back to those, those, that mindset. And oftentimes what happens is the courage it takes to jump and leap and go to, to release is actually because of what we hold dear in our, in, our, in our hearts, our families, our friendships, the way our belief systems have been structured. And we find something that doesn't gel with that and we want to release, but those individuals are holding us back to that mindset. But when we do, when we are courageous enough to leap, despite what everybody else might be talking about, we then have a rebirth. It's a new platform. I had to relearn how to walk again, how to run again, how to jump again. I had to get in the parallel bars, put on a prosthetic, um, learn how to manipulate a wheelchair. All these things were very new to me because I don't get that back. But once I understand how to do all that, then I have a resolve. I'm resolute. I understand exactly how I'm going to show up, how I'm going to, uh, it's, it's no longer, I'm going to back to where, what you think about me. You need to catch up to where I am. And that equals my liberation. And the liberation is not for me. The liberation is for me to be strong enough to go back and help somebody else with their journey. What, while, now, how, right? How am I going to do that? How am I, once I've learned this information, how do I need to go back and help them overcome those fears that they have? And that red line that goes from our fear passes through that redefining moment because the redefining moment is critical. The redefining moment is how we, um, how we choose to release. And no one can do that for us. No one can, can really push us out the plane or cause us to jump. We have to choose to do it ourselves. And there's no book that's going to tell you how to do that. You have to make that courageous step yourself. You have to trust that there's going to be something on the other side. Don't ask anybody to do that for you because you have to do that work. Mom can't do it for you. Dad can't do it for you. No one can do it for you but yourself. So that's the, the hard part about it. But once you do, then you can go to Sydney, Australia, like I did, and have six jumps at the Paralympic Games and have these type of results. So take a look at this. Let's take a look at the men's long jump F42 final starting list and Lucas Christen from Switzerland is the dominant one in this field. He holds both the world and Paralympic record in this event. Victor Goriansson from Sweden is up now ready for his third attempt. It's not a bad effort. He's pretty satisfied with it. 4.89. It's actually a season best for the Swede. 
Here is the man to beat. He is the world record holder, jumping 5.43 in 98 in Birmingham. Well, he's pleased the crowd. He's happy with that one. And so he should be. He's smashed his world mark with 5.57, a new world mark. Well, the pressure's really on now for John Register from the USA. 5.57, the mark to beat. Nice lead up, but it's short. He's not able to take the gold from Kristen, but he does move into second spot. So here are the results of the men's long jump final. Gold to Kristen, silver to Register, and Goriansen home with the bronze. So I must caveat that by saying every time I see that video, I do think I'm going to win the gold medal. Don't want to miss it again. <laughs> so anyway, on the elevator, elevator ride down the shaft and back out to kind of the, the, the platform where we, um, the track and field level, a reporter who once knew me at the uh, Southwest Conference, she comes up to me and she says, hey, John, congratulations. Uh, I have a question for you. And I said, yeah, for sure. I said, do you think with artificial limb technology, you know, when you ran in the Southwest Conference against Michael Johnson and you jumped against Carl Lewis, do you think with artificial limb technology that you could do that again? And I thought about her question for a moment and, and I paused, but then came back and said, no, I don't believe I can. But the question I believe really should be, or maybe of consideration should be, if Michael Johnson or Carl Lewis lost a limb, could they run as fast or jump as far as I do? And that's the catch up. That is the shift of the conversation of what we're all talking about with disability and disability sport on how we wanna move this conversation forward. People with disabilities wanna show up as who they are. They want to be in the moment. Um, they wanna be valued and respected for who they are. I have an infographic that uh, kind of shows you this journey, right? The serpentine journey, this pathway that goes from our fear and individ our individual fears all the way to our freedom and legacy and building that back. And if you just go to this website at amputatefear.com, you can get a free copy of that just to kind of help you to see where you might be on the process as you're looking at this through the lens of sport and disabilities. So I hope that that was great for you today. Um, I really enjoyed being here with you. I can't wait to talk a little bit more along tonight uh, for, the, for the session as well. And if you want to follow me, you can just go to johnregister.com. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. My mantra is always go forth, inspire your world because go is your command. Forth is your direction. Inspire, this is your vocation. Your because this DNA, this world, this, this DNA is personal to you and world because this is your sphere of influence. Thank you so much, everybody. God bless. Bye for now.